Welcome to the latest episode of Beatin' and Bangin'. I'm your host, Kyle Dalton. First off, hope everyone had a nice 4th of July with family and friends. I know I sure did. And secondly, wow, what a weekend in Chicago. In this video, I'm going to talk about it and take you behind the scenes of what I experienced this past weekend in the Windy City. That includes exclusive post-race interviews with Joey Logano, Ryan Blaney, and NASCAR president Steve Phelps. Let's go back to a week ago today and Wednesday when I first arrived. It just so happens that I arrived with my family in the middle of downtown at the exact same time as the NASCAR haulers, but it wasn't quite time for work yet. The first couple of days there were relaxing and enjoyable, except for the part that Chicago was classified as the unhealthiest city for air quality on the entire planet due to smoke from the Canadian wildfires. That didn't put a damper on attending a Cubs game at Wrigley Field, but it sure made for an interesting picture. And no, that's not a filter. That's the actual smoke. It did cause problems when trying to do one of the many touristy things and trying to check out the city from one of the skyscrapers. This was the 360 observation deck. Still amazing to be so high up, but the view obviously was not the best. After being a tourist one more day and viewing the city on a boat tour, it was time to go to work on Friday. Well, sort of. Work as in you get to drive around the 12 turn, 2.2 mile layout on the top level of a double decker bus with the rest of the media. Check out the video I created going through all the turns. Saturday was a big day with the first on-track action, excluding our record-setting bus run the day before, with practice and qualifying for both Xfinity and Cup cars. And I have to say, it was pretty damn cool walking around the track for the first time and seeing and hearing cars ripping through the streets of downtown Chicago. I camped out at a couple of positions for some photos, starting at turns 8, 9, and 10, or the curved portion of the track by Michigan Avenue. It was wild to see cars zipping by and sliding all over the place, and it was still dry. I eventually moved to turn 12 and got some great video as the cars made the final turn before the front stretch. That vantage point would prove to be even more fruitful on Sunday. Following practice and qualifying, cup drivers came into the media center for their traditional weekend interviews. More from that session in later videos. A short time later, Xfinity Series pulse hitter Cole Custer led the field to green and led every lap in the first stage. Then, Mother Nature introduced herself for what turned out to be a long and unwelcome stay. It started with a lightning delay that eventually forced NASCAR officials to postpone the race until Sunday morning. While no NASCAR action happened, apparently a local Chicagoan decided to have some fun on the track Saturday night, somehow managing to get on the track and test out the street circuit. When officials, teams, drivers, and fans woke up Sunday morning, the lightning was gone. Unfortunately, it had been replaced by a heavy rain. At 10.15 a.m., the National Weather Service issued a flash flood warning for the city of Chicago and said it was a life-threatening situation. The governing body was put in the unenviable position of delaying the Xfinity race yet again. Drivers eventually strapped into their rain-soaked cars but never turned an official lap. Just before 1 p.m., and with no end to the rain in sight, NASCAR made the unprecedented move and declared Cole Custer the winner via a statement. With the Xfinity race over, NASCAR officials focused on the Cup Series main event. But the rains continued and even intensified. Incredibly, Chicago received a record amount of rainfall for the day with some areas in the downtown area reporting up to nine inches. 
The races weren't the only things affected by the conditions, as the city shut down numerous train lines and closed some expressways. With the rain unrelenting, NASCAR officials called an audible for the pre-race ceremonies and held them inside the media center. Reporters from around the world stopped what they were doing and stood when the gathered choir started singing the national anthem. But it was just the rehearsal. NBC carried the invocation and national anthem from the media center just 10 minutes later. Chicago Bears quarterback Justin Fields, who was the Grand Marshal, also showed up in the media center prepared to give the command. But his duties would have to wait as the rains continued. Over an hour later, with the rain almost gone and track conditions suitable for racing, Fields returned to the media center and gave the command. What's up, Chicago? Drivers, start your engines. If I'm being completely honest, it was a one out of five stars because of his lack of enthusiasm. After all the delays, pole sitter Denny Hamlin finally led the field to green in a single file start and crossed the finish line at 5.37 p.m. His lead didn't last a lap, and interestingly, that wasn't even the top story from the opening trip around the 12-turn circuit. Multiple mishaps were, including Eric Amarola spinning in turn five, and just seconds later, Eric Jones locking up his brakes and escorting Brad Keselowski and Legacy Motor Club teammate Noah Gragson with him into the wall of tires in turn six. And that was just lap one. Hamlin got into the tires on lap two in turn two. Kyle Busch greeted the turn six tires on lap four, sending water exploding from the barrier as his number eight Richard Childress racing car got windshield deep in the rubber. Wet conditions remained on certain portions of the track throughout the race. And along with the changing concrete asphalt surface and bumps on the heavily trafficked roads proved problematic for the drivers and entertaining for the fans who to their credit turned out in force after enduring so many obstacles. The biggest crash came early in stage three when William Byron got hung up in the tires at turn 11. Kevin Harvick tried to avoid the HMS car and spun, and the stack up began. While there were 14 cars in the initial pileup, at one point there were 23 cars stopped at the turn. And as one local person noted in the media center, it was an official Chicago race with a massive traffic jam. The many accidents on the wet streets through downtown Chicago were entertaining for those in attendance and those watching from the windows and on the rooftops above in numerous nearby skyscrapers. This historic day for NASCAR was made even more historic when New Zealander Shane Van Gisbergen became the first driver in NASCAR's modern era and first since Johnny Rutherford did it in 1960 to win his debut Cup Series race. It was a fairy tale finish to a roller coaster of a weekend. Unlike most cup races, drivers finishing first through fifth are made available on pit road. This time, they were brought to the media center. Because it was a lengthy walk from pit road to the media center, and I wanted to cover what was happening at the start finish line at the end of the race, I had to be selective in who I interviewed. So I caught up with 2022 champion Joey Logano, had an entertaining walking interview with his Penske teammate Ryan Blaney, and got an exclusive interview with NASCAR president Steve Phelps. Take a listen. Yeah, it's a battle uh, for, for everybody, for NASCAR, for the teams, for the drivers. It's the battle. Uh, we got through it. <laughs> uh, we got a top 10 out of it. Get out of here. <laughs> from every type of conditioning, yeah, wet, drying, semi-wet, dark, uh, we've done it all, so, uh, so I'm out of here alive, I'm happy. Yeah, I didn't think it was too bad, I thought, uh, you know, I was surprised we got going, to be honest with you, and, um, yeah, having the wet, wet course was decent, uh, I stuffed her in the fence on the wet course, uh, and then once it dried out, it was kind of unique, you know, going from wet to dry, and kind of seeing it progress, and just car was hurt so I, th I thought it was a great event a lot of people were here just uh wish i wouldn't have stuffed her in the wall you know i don't think i've 
never felt more welcome in a city than what we felt here in Chicago. And it, it just the city opened its arms to us and embraced us. It was awesome. And despite five inches of rain or six inches of rain, just incredible. It was an absolutely incredible weekend for NASCAR, and you could feel the positive vibes as fans walk through the streets of Chicago after the race. Even with all of the challenges, the governing body made it work and showed that the sport, which is known for racing on ovals, can produce quality racing, making right and left turns through the streets of a major city. Looking back over the last several months, there was a lot of uncertainty by many in the industry coming into the Chicago race. That uncertainty was still present well into Sunday afternoon, with the weather wreaking havoc on the schedule. But just 75 laps and almost three hours later, on Sunday evening, everyone there realized they had just witnessed a piece of history and were a part of a moment that will undoubtedly go down as one of the highlights in the sport's 75-year history. And finally, one last piece of business. I want to congratulate our winner, Dell1195, for his fan submission question. He's the winner of a great NASCAR edition of Farkle. Stay tuned because we'll have more giveaways like this in the future. All right, guys, that's a wrap on Chicago. Let me know what you thought about the race. Did you enjoy it? What could be improved? Do you want to take it to different cities in the future? Let me know in the comments section. And as always, thanks again for checking out the channel. If you liked what you saw, please tell your fellow NASCAR buddies about what we're doing here at Beaten and Bangin'. And if you want to read more stories like this video, check out my articles at sportscasting.com. See you in the next video and have a great rest of your day.